Um, I hope everyone have a drink on their hand. I'm glad you guys survived the whole day. Uh, it's 6.30 or a bit over, close to 6.45. So we're going to start without further ado. Um, I just want to give you guys a bit of a background of the panelists here so that you know what questions to ask them later on. Um, so on my left here, I have Nicholas. I mean, he's more from the end user side, but he also does offensive security. So probably can ask a bit more about that. I have Cristofano. Uh, he's an independent researcher um, on the device from an from a advanced device level, uh, you know, security testing. Um, so from a device level, um, you can ask him what he's been saying on the market. Um, next will be um, Matteo. Um, he's more from the OEM product side, um, looking at it from, uh, from, from the opposing um, security. Um, you can also ask him on what he's been researching on and what he has been seeing on the market. Uh, last but not least is Andreas, um, particularly on the vulnerability research hub. Um, you know, so we can ask him about what kind of um, you know exploits that's been coming into the uh, research hub, and and what are the trends. So you know, I'll probably give every speaker um, a chance to talk about you know how they feel about today's topic on zero day um, market. You know, what are the trends? What are the impact to the market that they have seen? And I give them each a few minutes to talk about um, from their own individual perspective. Um, and then I'll ask other uh, more probing questions, hopefully give you guys insight. I will also give you guys a chance to ask questions as well. Uh, so don't be shy to pick up, put up your hand and you know ask questions that is burning. Um, I'll let uh, Andreas start first um, to sort of talk about you know what has we been seeing from the vulnerability um, research hub, you know what kind of exploits is coming in and what are the trends, and then I'll pass down the mic from, from that end. Uh, Andreas? Is it on? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, well, uh, what, what we can see from our point of view is that there is a lot of research going on. Uh, we receive a lot of offers almost daily. Uh, there is a lot of difference in quality in this uh, research. Uh, top quality research is very rare, unfortunately. Also because the low-hanging fruits have all been picked already. So it's pretty easy to find an XSS, but to find a full chain, working chain for iOS 11X is incredibly complex and, and hard. So uh, what we're seeing is that people is offering us a lot of stuff which we don't want to buy. <laughs> so they're offering us, which is very frightening, a lot of stuff related to connected vehicles, IoT stuff, uh, wearable healthcare devices, you know, crazy stuff that we don't want to buy at all because it's just, I mean, this kind of exploits can only be used to harm human life or to kill somebody. Hmm? But there's a lot of these things. Uh, we receive a lot of ICS and SCADA related uh, offers, which we don't buy. And a few interesting things related to uh, browsers uh, and mobile platforms, uh, which is what we are interested into because we are working with uh, law enforcement and uh, intelligence agencies, and they want tools to perform information gathering activities. Uh, so, of course, we are very focused on the client side and on very specific kind of targets. But anyway, this said, uh, statistics. Uh, I can give you a few numbers. I never gave these numbers in public before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since April, when we launched our uh, bug bounty program, uh, we received, uh, uh, including last night, uh, almost 120 different offers. And uh, we purchased six of them. So that is the ratio in between what we've been offered and what we buy. And we spent five millions on these six offers. Um, but again, we are focusing on a very specific set of targets and we are refusing more than 90% of what they offer us. Definitely more than 90%. So our case is probably a little bit uh, unusual. Yep. 
the market is there anyway. I mean, the same offers that we received are all over the place. There are so many brokers, so many people dealing with this stuff uh, in many countries and all regions of the world nowadays. So imagine how big the, the overall market is. And in yep. four months, 120 exploits, which on average can be paid around $200,000 each. So we're talking about several uh, million dollars of, of goods which are being traded. Uh, and this is only the part that we see is the tip of the iceberg. A lot of stuff is not being traded publicly, or at least it's not being offered to us. It's being traded in closed forums or in underground areas of the internet for criminal purposes, for example. So uh, I have mixed feelings. The market is there. It's totally unregulated, which is something mm. that we will discuss later, is focusing on, in my opinion, the wrong stuff, because we are receiving so much stuff which is only dangerous but not useful for any reasonable usage. Um, the low-hanging fruits have been picked, which means that to find good stuff is getting harder and harder every day. And then there is a lot of noise, a lot of scammers, a lot of people who are pretending to have something, but they don't have anything, and, you know, but that's just part of the, of the, of being in this business. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Andre. Next, I'll turn to the, the researchers, Matthias, and, and later on to Cristofano as well from, from the ground, from the researchers that yep. you've done. What have you been seeing on, on the zero day mar um, exploit market? So. From a research perspective, um, what I saw in the past like five, six years is that usually uh, the research and also the offers to, to bug bounty programs or, or exploit markets usually follows what is uh, um, the, the, the state or intelligence agency wants and they try to follow the same steps in order to, to increase the scope of the vulnerabilities that has been, uh, that has been found. For example, uh, SCADA and ICS security is uh, a trending topic now, but uh, we start to see uh, exploit used in the wild like 10 years ago or more, where uh, they, they intended to do harms, actually. For example, let's think about the Iranian nuclear plants where an actual ICS exploit has been used to, to basically stop the plant. And, and from there, a lot of uh, research, a lot of money have been invested in uh, SCADA security. Before that, uh, usually no one spoke about security of uh, critical infrastructure of SCADA equipments. So, yeah, I see a lot of uh, following between the researcher and the, the let's say, black market of, uh, of this kind of vulnerability. So vulnerabilities that are not publicly uh, traded. Uh, between markets or between a bug bounty program or brokers or whatever. Uh, and that's, in my opinion, is uh, not a very good stuff because um, not having actors that are willing to buy this kind of vulnerability for reporting them or for, a, let's say, uh, legit use opens the market to bad guys. So if the bad guys are willing to spend the money, and the vulnerabilities are out there, uh, there is someone who will find them and will try to sell them. So, as I said, and also as uh, Andrea said, um, the lack of regulation from one hand brings uh, uh, confusion in the market. You don't know uh, what's the best place to sell, it, what is the, who is the best actor to start selling. And from the other hand, uh, too much regulation will still increase the black market for vulnerabilities that actually do arms or potentially can do arms to a lot of people. Um, from a research perspective, again, the, the trend is moving also on critical infrastructure security. So every asset that has a cybersecurity um, vulnerability that impacts the real life, so the physical world and not only the cyber world. 
Okay, thanks. And what about Cristofano from from the device level? You know, what have you been seeing um, out there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it was mentioning that uh, my perspective is more from devices in production while they are being produced. While Matteo, I think the focus is more on uh, end devices already in the market. Usually, my work is instead during the development stage. Not only with OEM, but even with, let's say, sock manufacturers or hardware design. Usually I do work with other people, what other people call hardware. So having said that, um, I need to say that there is a very big distinction uh, that needs to be made between devices where, where security has been factored in by design at the start. I'm talking about things like smart card. It's still a device, but it's a completely different range of security features than a router. So we need to think about these devices like the one intended to be secure by design, like smart card, hardware security modules, uh, even set of boxes, for example, or other payment system. Don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about POS, but about payment system which might use other security features and so on. Okay, having said that, having said that, there is this big distinction. So what I'm seeing happening as the um, Devices where security has not been factored in from the start, either because it's not important usually or not considered as important, like in webcam routers or things, or where security has become added afterwards. I don't know, critical infrastructure, smart meters, and all these things. Yeah. Well, for this one, I do see that there is a lot of public uh, talk and relevance. I do see routers appearing, appearing in uh, vulnerability reward programs or bug bounties. I would be extremely surprised if you find that and the device of the other category appearing in. So I think that the first distinction we need to make in our mind is that not all devices are just the devices that we think a router is. There are entire things which you can find even protection against physical attacks. What physical means, focused ion beams, like um, fault injection attacks, side channel analysis against uh, even uh, gate level reverse engineering. There are, they do exist, and it's worth mentioning that these are also embedded devices, but we should not make the confusion that every embedded device is as just the same level of, sorry, low level security that we have seen or we do actually see every day. So this is the first point. Right. For the lower class, uh, yes, I do see that happening every day. I mean, you just go um, on any, even uh, on um, security focus, or I mean, any mailing list that talks about security, you will find an advisor about a router, a webcam every day. Yep. For the other class, it's completely another story. Mm. That you don't have either reported vulnerabilities or public vulnerabilities, and they are they might be completely handled in a different way. Okay, okay, that's that's a very good insight. Uh, our next um, ask uh, Nicholas as well. I mean, from your personal opinion, um, you know, using secu uh, offensive security, how are you sort of uh, enabling or help your defender to to better be prepared, prepared for such trend where you you heard from the researchers, you know, exploits are getting you know being traded openly in the market, uh, be it commercial or in, in the dark net. Um, you know, what are you sort of you know, personally doing um, in, in your own opinion? Yeah. Yes, thank you. I think it is important to, to define what is offensive security for a financial organization. Mm. So we are representing uh, the view of an attacker to challenge the organization and uh, validate basically the effectiveness of our controls. So we are not attacking uh, other banks. We are not retaliating when we are under okay. attack. We are basically uh, representing uh, the, the view of an attacker for mm -hmm. the sake of the defense. Okay. So we are typically on the receiving end of yep. the, of the zero-day zero vulnerabilities because we offer uh, products and services to our customers. And it might be possible, while everything is done to protect it, it might be possible that uh, we may have uh, vulnerabilities. Mm. So um, we are the receiving end where some uh, researcher may find something against our uh, product and services and alert us so that we can fix it. Yep. But okay. we do not buy in, uh, zero days for the sake of offensive, for example. 
Right. Okay. So, so that's good to know. Um, so at least you are helping, you know, to prevent um, um, the real attacker to coming to attack your your bank, so to speak, um, to by by sort of red teaming, you know, the internal blue team to skill up their their defenses. Um, one point that we mentioned, there's a distinction of, you know, not all exploits are the same. Um, some are more critical than the others, particularly with the, the trend of IT and OT market converging. Um, I think e even in just this year alone, I heard a lot of uh, IT and OT um, convergence. Uh, Singapore is un embarking on a smart city initiative. Um, so all this become really relevant and as well scary because you know exploits are now being traded uh, both commercially and, and whatnot. Um, I just want to probably circle back to Andreas as well. Um, in your view, in what you see in the uh, vulnerability research hub, um, you know what kind of a distinction would you make in terms of the exploits? You know, well, you see, there are usually exploits are put all together. So if you look at a list of CVEs you will see things which are extremely dangerous associated with things which are not so dangerous and may it, and their CVE uh, index is not related to the real criticality which is bad hmm? uh, because of course an exploit is only useful if you can deploy it into the real world and obtain some sort of effect it can be uh, have a CVE level of 10, but then you cannot use it in real life. So you're not going to, uh, to see it used for, for real attacks. So, uh, of course there are differences. What we're trying to do as, as a crowd fans is to talk to, um, uh, rule makers in Europe and elsewhere, trying to convince them that the Vassana Treaty is not the right tool to manage this stuff. The Vassana Treaty, you know what it is? It's an international treaty which was uh, designed to uh, handle dual-use technologies uh, in a way that their trade becomes accountable. But it doesn't work well with software, and, and it doesn't work well with zero days. Uh, so nowadays, it's the only thing internationally that can be used to somehow regulate this this market. So we are definitely uh, missing a proper regulation of this field. As it is now, it's a wild west. It's basically a total mess. Uh, it makes no sense. Also considering that nation states in the last three or four years have published their own cyber strategies and all of them publicly said we are going to also use active defense tools or strategies which means we're going to attack. Okay. Uh, so it's a weird situation where we supply know-how to entities at the nation state level which publicly said they are going to use this stuff to attack, but we are, we don't exist <laughs> uh, by the law. Huh? So strange. I mean, if they uh, are procuring weapon systems for their militaries, they have uh, procurement processes and laws and regulations for that. But for procuring cyber tools, there is nothing. Okay? Which means that, first of all, researchers are in danger. They can be jailed, they can have consequences, they can go through a lot of trouble in certain circumstances. Uh, for example, when we pay them, they have troubles because they don't know how to explain where this money came from, okay. <laughs> which seems a stupid thing, but it's <laughs> really important. Um, so uh, second, our customers uh, don't know how to deal with this stuff because they have bureaucracies, they have in their organizations processes which are don't, do not fit with this kind of technologies, which have a shelf life of three months or six months. They are used to buy weapon systems which have a, a life cycle of 30 years, and now they have to manage an arsenal of tools which have a shelf life of three months. So they're going mad. 
uh, after this uh, kind of stuff. Mm? So they either buy the wrong tools or they don't buy the right tools when there is the opportunity to do so and so on and so on. So overall the market is totally screw up. Mm? If I can use a technical term. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's okay, that's okay. Let's can I use all this? Yep. Because it's uh, in, in old French, yep. it, it really means, you know, exactly what we see every day. It's a total mess. So what, what, what we're trying to do is, on one hand, to talk with lawmakers, trying to help them understand the, the topic because they don't understand the topic. That's what's happening right now. And then we're trying to talk with the researchers, convincing them to follow some sort of standards which do not exist in how to submit this stuff, how to discuss the technology uh, aspects, how to discuss the pricing, how to define contracts, which usually do not exist. We are trying to we define contracts with a team of lawyers, and it's uh, probably a primer. Right. Because usually there are no contracts, which means that you think you bought an apple, and instead you end up buying a banana. It always happened. Uh, with the old uh, crafts of the trade that you buy something that only works when there is full moon and it's Friday uh, and otherwise it doesn't, but you didn't know it because they <laughs> didn't tell you. I mean, it's uh, crazy. So we're trying to introduce some standards, some logic into this mess uh, for the good of all the involved parties, including ourselves, of course, because we are not here for, uh, uh, you know, for just for fun. Uh, this said, the biggest problem nowadays is that if this market is not somehow regulated or if it doesn't self-regulate, which is also an option, at least to a certain degree, we are going to reach a tipping point uh, soon not talking about years, it's probably going to be within months, where the stuff that is being sold is so, so dangerous that we will have uh, consequences. And it will backlash against the whole community. Because if some idiot sells a very bad zero-day uh, exploit against some ICS or skill or connected vehicle or wearable healthcare device, whatever, and someone dies, of course, you can imagine the, the backlash in terms of image against the whole category of hackers and researchers all over the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, we really must uh, work together on this. It's some, even if you don't agree with what we do, and I perfectly understand if you think that what we are doing is um, unethical, uh, from an activist point of view, some people have this kind of... Um, uh, idealistic uh, mm -hmm. vision of the world, but I, I am totally okay with it. Even if we don't agree on what we are, each one of us doing, we should agree on the fact that it is time to do something because otherwise there will be a backlash against yep. everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good point. And, and you talk about two things, one on, on mm -hmm. regulation and self-regulation. Uh, I mean, in the Singapore as well as the, the regional context, uh, Singapore have uh, launched a cybersecurity bill, uh, specifically, you know, legislating the, the 11 critical information infrastructure owners. Um, but that's only just one country. Uh, a lot of countries around the region trying to do that. But country as individual is not sufficient. No one, and it's not properly realistic to have all countries in the world all agree to the same treaty as well. Um, and then I probably turn to the researchers as well, you know, what kind of solutions could we then do? You know, from an industry perspective, uh, in terms of self-regulation, what would be an ideal uh, scenario for, for you from your own expert opinions? Before I turn to Nicholas from an end user, what do you like to see the industry doing so that, you know, we can best, best self-regulate ourselves before, you know, we are forced to... So I, I, I skip the question for a moment and yep. I want to ask a question. Sure, to, sure, to, go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, as you yeah. said, the, the, the problem is that there is no regulation and there is no uh, clear way to understand if the expert that I'm selling will be used against uh, uh, with a purpose 
uh, an legit uh, um, goal or to cause disruption, arms, and whatever. But I think this is a very similar. It's difficult to regulate also because it's similar to what happens with the intelligence agency, right? So if I want to target, if I'm an intelligence agency um, and I need to target uh, someone for information or for uh, intelligence data, uh, I don't want that to be public. I don't want to have, I mean, it's also for uh, standard intelligence agency, like old style without the cyber stuff. It's uh, not regulated at the moment and it will never be probably because no one wants to regulate something that they need in order to... Of course, <coughs> there is but this consider this. This is something that a few people understand. Uh, we are not talking about mass surveillance here. Okay, mass surveillance is being performed typically at the ISP level or telco level, while the things we are dealing with are used for very targeted operations against individuals. Like a single iOS or Android chain is used 10 times, and that's it. Okay, it's not used for spying on the population, because that would create attribution that would burn the uh, capability too soon, and so on and so on. So many activists have this idea that these tools are being used against uh, you know, the common uh, man on the street. It's not true. It's being used against terrorists, against drug lords, uh, armed dealers, and this kind of people. So yeah, that's, that's exactly my targets. point. I'm... But the problem is that Nowadays, we don't even have a taxonomy of exploits. There is no taxonomy of exploits. So sometimes they offer us things which are so dangerous and useless for information gathering purposes that we suggest the researcher to go public and disclose it. Or anyway, we bounce him back. But someone else will not, probably. So. There are two issues. First of all, there is not a taxonomy. Nobody nowadays is able to say this thing is too dangerous. So the threshold is beyond an acceptable level. It must be disclosed. Nobody is able to do this. Bad. Second, someone will always be willing to buy it, even if it's a horrible, horrible uh, vulnerability, which is another problem. Uh, intelligence agencies are not buying as the agency. They are buying as units. So one unit doesn't even know what the other unit has bought. So, for example, in the U.S., they created this uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, committee, which should be uh, should is tasked to make a, a government level vulnerability disclosure. Uh, analyzing the vulnerabilities that their uh, intel intelligence agencies are buying and deciding which one should be disclosed and which one should not be disclosed. It doesn't work because the head of the intelligence agency doesn't know what his people have bought. So how can he report to this committee uh, we have this kind of stuff, and what do you think? Should we disclose it or not? Yeah. It's simply impossible. Mm -hmm. is, is that a view of not plausible de deniability where they deliberately not oh, wanting so to know? They is, want. Do you see that trend? They trend? want yeah. to have this kind of uh, secrecy mm -hmm. because, of course, the operations that they are uh, after maybe took years to set up, and maybe the target is extremely valuable. And so they cannot burn their sources of exploits. They cannot even disclose that they have that kind of exploit. Hmm? So given this situation, self-regulation is absolutely necessary from the actors who are supplying these capabilities to them. They will buy whatever it takes to fulfill their mission. So it is up to us to give them the right tools and not the wrong tools. Huh? Uh, it is very, very difficult. I mean, I don't have a clear solution. Do you think that this will open up the black market? I mean, if an intelligence agency, an operator, 
uh, I don't care if I buy from a, let's say, legal source or not, because my goal is to get the kind of intelligence. Well, and But on the other hand, I don't want to cause uh, disruption of arms. I'm interested only in that kind of intelligence data. Well, see what happened with Stuxnet. They didn't intend to do harm, but they did a lot of harm. Because <laughs> it spread all over the world and it created a lot of problems outside the specific target, which was the Natanz uh, uranium enrichment facility. So uh, hundreds of millions were wasted because Stuxnet went around and did random damages years after the, the, the attack was performed on, on the Iranian plant. So even if they don't mean to do harm, they still have the opportunity to do so because of the nature of this stuff. I, I would like to say something that is taboo, if you agree. <laughs> the real problem is that vendors are not liable for defects of their products. Yeah, and I think we, we, we've seen a lot of that, particularly in the ICS world, where you know, things doesn't change for 10, 20 years. Uh, I'll probably turn over to Cristofano as well from the device yeah. perspective. Um, you know, what have you been seeing, particularly working closely with the, yeah. the device manufacturers? Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I, I think that these kind of problems are quite exacerbated for uh, devices which now are basically now our security range like mm. 10 years ago or 15 years ago it was not the case basically so we have always had like ICS and SCADA system but that has become critical as soon as we started connecting them and reachable from the outside I mean I'm not saying that they were not necessarily vulnerable before but the reachability is completely different but also uh, let's think a number of uh, devices I think we are also as a community we have a lot to improve in terms of how we deal with what we call device security. First, a device that we say, we think we actually have a flat model in our mind, like the manufacturer has made the device. Well, I would like to say something a bit disruptive. No one owns a device, not you as a user and not even a manufacturer. The reason is that these devices are the result of an ecosystem effort where there are production chains where you have SOC manufacturer, software components and library coming from open source. Then you have a, like 100 DMA engine on some system on chip, for, for example. You have software components which are developed by the OEM, by the SOC manufacturer, by someone providing the TE on a mobile phone. These are all different parties. No one really actually owns the device. So our mental model, how do we approach this, is actually really simplistic and should be improved. We should think of devices as products, as a result of an ecosystem. So this means there is a production change that goes from producing the silicones and making, uh, routing all the gates and creating the design into a SOC, into a CPU. Then from there, you have a lot of components that are built in in a process that can be even two or four years long before the actual product from the digital design arrives to the market. Anything can happen during this chain. So I think that how we approach the problem is quite simplistic. We look at device, manufacturer, attribution is there. So even if you put a number of liabilities, how can we put be the, let's say, the, the OEM responsible for vulnerabilities which are acquired above the chain? Think about broad pound. Of course, broad pound affected both Apple devices and Android devices. Do we hold responsible Apple for that, or Android for that, or and the Android manufacturer for that? Well, of course, we are buying a product for them, so we expect some security over there. But the actual vulnerability is not under their control. It's basically in a broad com components which needs to be updated at a firmware level. So the whole point of thinking a device like a flat thing owned by someone is completely wrong. Mm. Nowadays, a device is not owned by anybody. <clears throat> you just buy it from someone. So this means it's completely different from basically a PC where we usually have more or less a simplistic view of the operating system and then the CPU. We are not there anymore. I mean, we are in a situation where a device can have even, let's say, 50 different chips. 
the more complex one, or even 100 in some specific cases. I mean, think about your mobile phones, right? Then you have the radio SOC, the Wi-Fi SOC, the audio processor, then you have the video processor, or you have a separate CPU with a secure element. You have so many executing points, which talking about a device and manufacturer liability, I think it will hit what's meshed really against the wall. Yep. Because the, the attribution of such liabilities is instead across. Let me add one single point. I think also the way we first test security and rate security usually is not um, optimal for devices during development. For example, let's assume that I'm in a lucky situation testing something before it comes to the market. Then if you find a vulnerability, what do you use? CVSS, right? But the CVSS takes the point where the, 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 the device is within an environment, so you have the base impact, then you have all the other ratings. That device is not even being released yet. How can you compute the rating of that? So all these things are uh, needs to be updated, and we need to think in a dimension which production chain long, not device only. And there is much to there needs to be considered and thought and learned about this. Probably the this small intervention are only for giving you the idea that the problem is much more complex, like I buy a device and I find an XSS. The, uh, for example, vulnerabilities at firmware level in some things are not usually found by security testing company, but by active researchers which are dedicated to that field. That is the, the difference, because if you buy a webcam, yeah, I can bypass the, the authentication Mm. But then, what happens? What is still lying behind? Yeah. So there are a number of questions which I would like to discuss at some point, uh, also with um, with the audience. Yeah. But that well, I think our approach nowadays is simplistic. Like device vulnerable, you patch, you are done. Mm. Last point is that the device has been patched. The point is, is it secure now? How do you know it? No, you don't. It's just been patched. How can you say that this device is more secure than another when we actually resort to compare device, devices only by saying there is a vulnerability and it's been patched? Yeah. It's not been more secure because it's been patched. It's just been restored to the initial understanding. So that's, that's a very good point. And I'll probably turn on to Nicholas as well. You know, from what you're hearing so far, so what do you do in, uh, you know, in, inside your environment to make sure that, you know, this kind of supply chain risk has been managed. Uh, do you do, you know, additional, uh, you know, deploy a different risk assessment methodology, doing, uh, you know, another level of threat modeling, um, as you hear of this kind of thing. Um, before I turn over to Matteo as well on what else do you see, I also will turn to the audience, uh, particularly people from the end user environment, you know, what other, you know, methods that you all do to, to mitigate such kind of, uh, um, supply chain, uh, risk? So this, this kind of uh, threat is indeed considered, and in fact, uh, we all know that it's not a question of uh, if we are going to get attacked, it's a question of when. So we have to get ready, and assuming, uh, we, we, are, we are assuming that we have been breached in a day-to-day -day life, and it yep. is typically my, my point of view, mm. where basically we are simulating uh, that the, the organization that have been breached, so that we can get ready when it will really happen. Yep. So we are simulating uh, the actions of uh, of real attacker, and from the defensive side, we are putting layers after layers, hoping that at least one of the layer will catch uh, the the attack. Because it is not just one vulnerability that is sufficient to compromise an organization in order to achieve a goal. Uh, because after all, the attacker is, uh, wants to to achieve a goal, whether to steal money, whether to disrupt the, the operation, or access uh, certain data. And in order to achieve that goal, multiple steps are, are required. So we try to understand all of this, and we try to simulate every single technique that we can, uh, that we are aware of. But of course, it doesn't uh, address the the unknown unknown. If yep. if there's something out there that we are, we are not uh, aware of, um, we won't be able to catch it. But by putting many layers and by simulating all the possible techniques, hopefully. Uh, we will get ready uh, to, add, to 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 block the attack yep. before it goes too far. Yep, that's 
is very good. I mean, um, from your point, using your offensive security to stimulate the attacker and trying to find and mitigate that uh, beforehand. Um, anyone from the audience like to share their view on what other techniques do you do to manage supply chain risks uh, that was mentioned earlier? Anyone? Okay. Um, okay, I won't put you guys in the spot. I'll turn back to uh, Matteo from your view as well, from the you know, end product perspective, and what are your other clients are doing, and you know, how do you advise them on, on you know to address this kind of supply chain uh, issue? So I, I completely agree with the, what Christopher said that the problem is not only on the device at the end of the chain, yep. uh, but at the same time, at the moment. Uh, uh, there is another issue that is not the vulnerability itself, but is the, the, the marketing problem behind that. Yep. So if I found a vulnerability in a router, let's say uh, a Netgear device, um, the Netgear is held, at the moment is held responsible for that vulnerability and uh, the, the, the people, the market, the public will uh, try to, we, we want a, a response from, mm -hmm. from the vendor. Yep. Uh, so that means that the vendor is having a bad reputation because of that vulnerability. So this adds complexity to the liability problem, right? Mm. And this increase when we're speaking about critical infrastructure and, yep. and for example, uh, smart cities or ICS uh, SCADA devices. Because at the same time, we are not only having a vulnerability that allows an attacker to steal uh, an individual information or, or access an individual data, but we are speaking about a single vulnerability that affects hundreds, if not thousands of people. Uh, and that causes, yes, a uh, very good uh, damage in yep. terms of arms to the people, but also mm -hmm. a huge um, marketing problem for, for yep. the vendors and the regulators or the city that is implementing that, uh, that specific model or the specific uh, equipment. Okay. So the trends need to be so also from the perspective uh, of the of the chain, of course, of all the actors inside this chain. But at the same time, also we need to, to understand the, the business models behind the acquisition of a specific equipment and uh, the use case yep. for that yep. specific environment, and and try to see how we can uh, manage and limit the damage that can be done if a vulnerability is found. Because as uh, as they said, the vulnerability will be found. A vulnerability will be found. It's just a, a matter of when. So we need to find a way in order to limit the, the cause of this vulnerability. And with the zero day markets, with the black markets and this kind of stuff, uh, bad guys will be more interested in, in critical infrastructure stuff. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I completely agree. I think it makes, it worth making a distinction between if you are applying security before release, probably, the way you would evaluate a target or rate of vulnerability or things like that before release is quite different from instead the impact that such vulnerability would have once the product is released in the field. For example, in the, uh, for instance, in the example that you gave, I find completely sensible to use a CVSS rating methodology because you have a, a vulnerability and an environment, basically. And, and I think that makes a, a lot of sense because we need to distinguish between the product and the use case of such product. You can use a mobile phone for many different use cases, which you not know, even the vendor might have even thought about it, for example. And in that specific case, it might be relevant if you have some kind of authentication on some interfaces or not, for example. So, or uh, impacts of vulnerability on some uh, attack surface which has not been evaluated during the proper use case evaluated during the manufacturing. So I do see that they are both extremely relevant, but the way you actually perform them are a bit different. They require a bit different approaches if you are doing working with a device which is still being developed or has been already released. And what you said, I, I, I find that you're completely in tune. These two words at some point, they are really, really, really close to each other. And when it enters in the field, of course, you need to assess the criticality of what has been found towards the ecosystem. Um, the next, as an example, a vulnerable, a vulnerable router, the vulnerability impact can be seen on the router right. or on the affected ecosystem, yep. which are around, which you don't know which are there when they are being manufactured. So yep. for sure, that kind of security is extremely relevant, which is in-field security. 
And I think that it, we need to do that at, in both places. Mm. So what, what can we do as an industry, right? With certification or forcing the vendors to undergo some sort of uh, due diligence, would that help? Uh, I'll turn back to Nicholas from an end-user perspective. What will give you the, the, the best assurance um, when you're picking sort of a technology product uh, if the vendor would have undergone some sort of a technical due diligence, like a common criteria or some sort of testing, would you be assured by that? Would you still want to conduct your own independent uh, security testing to make sure that you know they, they are what they claim they are? Yes, yeah. we, we, we don't assume that things are secure. Yep, that's so good. So this, this is exactly why we... We, we, we stimulate uh, mm. all part of the organization, yep. whether it is uh, hardware, people, processes, any, anything. And uh, you, you, you mentioned about re regulations. Mm. Um, I think regulation is good, but regulation is often seen as compliance. Yep. And compliance means that we try to pass the minimum in mm. order to get the rubber stamp. That's right. And mm. say that, okay, we are minimally secure. Mm. Where I think we need to change uh, our mindset, and it is at least... Uh, what we are trying to do, uh, try to secure uh, the application or the device or, or whatever that is from the beginning and try to address uh, every class of vulnerability. And I still find personally that it is, um, uh, yeah, we, we still find classes of vulnerability that should have been gone a long time ago because right. they are very well documented. Mm. They are uh, easy to uh, prevent and easy to detect way before it was. Uh, really on to the, the, the public yep. and therefore being used. Mm, okay. I again turn again to the floor. Um, anyone else have any points that they want to raise or any questions they want to ask any of the panelists? There's a question. Hi. Um, so if I understood correctly, what you mentioned, Andrea, was that you have you know, 90, 100 plus different offers, you accepted six, and out of the six, you pay five million. So that's about a million per, per export. That's a lot of money. And you mentioned that the researchers had some problem explaining to people where they got this million dollars from. Um, how much of that exploit do you, I mean, at some point, if you just black box the whole thing, it looks like a money laundering scheme, right? I paid this guy $10 million because it's an exploit, but I can't show you the exploit. Uh, how, how, how much of the exploit do you share to whoever it is that needs to be shared. So at least the, there is some proof that the exploit was there that justifies the money paid out against looking like a, you know, a money laundering scam. <laughs> because we write, uh, we wrote, we define very good contracts. So these guys can go to the bank and show the contracts saying there is a purchase for, uh, uh, soft research on software vulnerabilities because what we are trading is know-how basically. Consider that most of the times we have to totally rewrite the exploit itself because very good exploiters are not good programmers usually. Okay. <laughs> I want to be fair. Uh, which is okay because we document, we test, we improve, we polish, we rewrite if necessary. Okay. So the, uh, the contract is for uh, vulnerability research uh, activities, and for the delivery of uh, proof of concept, okay? Uh, the price can be high. I mean, it depends. Uh, the, the, I mean, how high it is, it's, it is relative. Mm? Depends on the, on, on the demand side of the market. I would be happy to pay one-tenth if the market would be lower, but it, it is not. Um, there is probably a ceiling which we will hit sooner or later in these prices because it will be, we get uh, too strange to pay more than a couple of millions for something. Huh? Also because the shelf life is three months on average. So that would be very stupid to, to pay much more than we already do. But anyway, uh, in one case, a researcher was called by the bank asking what the hell is going on. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, of course, we uh, couldn't disclose the exact nature of this research, but we supported the researcher in 
explaining to the bank that it wasn't uh, uh, a sale of uh, uh, a ship of cocaine uh, <laughs> from from Colombia. Um, <clears throat> still, it also depends on the countries. In some countries, you simply cannot do this kind of stuff, period. In other countries, which do not adhere to the uh, Vassana Treaty, you are, you have more options. In other countries, for example, in all the European countries, they are all, uh, they all signed the West Vassana Treaty, so it's very complex to buy from European researchers. Hmm? Um, not only for us, which are based in Dubai, so outside the European community, but also within the European community. There's a lot of paperwork, a lot of stuff going on. <coughs> Uh, for example, taxes. Can you imagine uh, if you follow all the, as you should do, all the rules, in, you would have to pay taxes on that, on that, on that amount. Uh, which we, we highly encourage researchers to do all the paperwork and to abide to the law. Uh, this really depends on where they are, what kind of, position they have, if they use proxies, or if they want to be paid with uh, uh, cryptocurrencies or not, and so on and so on. It's it's very complicated, and again, I, I, I want to stress it again, this is due to the fact that this field officially doesn't exist, but it, it does. <laughs> so the real problem for us is to normalize it, to make it legit to find a way to do this kind of, of uh, it's a very niche sector, of course, but to do this kind of work in a, uh, as, much, as transparent as possible, as much transparent as possible way. At least declaring, look, we are doing this. We cannot tell you what we are actually doing because it's covered by several layers of NDAs and probably we will disappear <laughs> if you if, if we say too much. But we need to um, to become uh, visible, mm -hmm. and that's why our lawyers have has, uh, wrote these contracts in a way that protect the researchers. Of course, again, don't do this kind of stuff if you are from from certain countries where there is. A, it's a, it's a criminal offense to sell this kind of capabilities to uh, foreigners, for example. A few countries are very, very strict on this. Um, when we will, we will uh, open to the public the vulnerability research platform in a few days, we will also, uh, in the next days, uh, publish uh, templates for contracts, okay? Because since we already prepare these contracts, if they become a standard or just a template for, you know, more complex contracts, we, we, would, we would be very happy because this would mean that we have contributed some standardization to, to the market, which is a good starting point. It's just the beginning. Uh, so we will see what happens in September after the VRP, the Vulnerability Research Platform, is open to the public and the contracts are made available as templates. If the community will criticize us, they, they will attack us probably. <laughs> I expect this. Um, uh, or if they will give us suggestions, it's, it's, everything is new, so it's just a, a, an attempt that we are making, trying to normalize the field. Let's see if it works. Yep, okay, that's good. Hope that answers your question. Um, anyone else have any other question? I'm, I'm conscious that we've got five minutes left, or there's a question over there. Yep. Um, yeah, my question is to Andrea again. Um, so obviously by exploits from someone and you sell it to a client, is this some way for you to know if the thing that you're giving out to a client will not be used for 
offensive reasons. Is there some kind of checks you do or do you just not care about it? No. We care. We care. So we, the vetting that we can do on the customers is limited. Uh, and so we are using this common sense uh, criteria. We don't sell to countries which are on a United Nations blacklist or known for serious human rights violations or on some technological embargo from the international community. <clears throat> and that's all we can do. Also, we, we will never know how they use this know-how. It's impossible. I, I don't want to know, actually. You also but, said that you limit the type of but, exploit. Yes, there, example, are, there are two main filters that we are trying to apply to be um, safe. The first is to avoid countries which have definitely no, um, uh, I mean, are not eligible uh, from our point of view. And the second is to only concentrate on exploits which are useful for information gathering purposes. So the two things combined reduce the risks that what we are selling them can be used to seriously harm some innocent. Because if it is used against the drug lord, uh, of course, I am, I am happy with my conscience. If it is used against uh, a human rights activist, I am more uh, preoccupied. Okay? Um, this said, we cannot know. One thing that we are doing is that we are avoiding to sell to uh, middlemen or integrators. So we try to sell directly to the agency or to the country, and then they will use their own integrators to use this know-how within a broader platform. Because, for example, we do not develop implants. Someone else is doing it. Implants which use zero days to access the device, but then the implant is the thing that, you know, gathers the information, exfiltrates the information. So, so if, we, if you sell to integrators, you totally lose control because an integrator will always try to maximize their profits by selling to all the available customers. So by selling directly to the end users, we probably avoid some problems. Uh, Again, this must be improved. Huh? We are starting from a very low level of uh, the situation is bad. We need to slowly improve it. Yeah. Okay. Out of, okay. Out of curiosity, did you receive many bug collisions from the bugs that you purchased? Sorry? Did you receive many bug collisions from the bugs that you purchased? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I would say 20 from the bugs that we purchased or the offer that we received. From the bugs that you purchased? No, 0%. But from the ones you received, you had many? 25 to 30%. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Um, I think we are, we are coming down to time. I want to give the panelists one minute each to sort of wrap up. Um, you know, what's your final thought on how we collectively can, can improve the industry? I definitely see that Andres, uh, have the position to lead the market by standardizing, um, you know, the, the way of how, you know, exploits are being traded as well as standardizing the taxonomy of exploit, uh, definitions. Um, but I'll probably hand over each of you one minute to see, you know, what do you think or what do you advocate? Yeah. Well, I would say one last thing because I already talked too much. <laughs> um, we can cooperate. I think there is a space and that this is the right time. We are very open to suggestions. We don't think we know uh, the, the truth or that we have all the solutions. It is a, a moment in history when we can uh, make the difference. Historically, this market developed in a way which is nowadays unsustainable and wrong. So if we can find better ways 
since this is going to stay, I mean, it's not going to go away. Even if we wish that it didn't exist, it will exist. So given the reality, how can we improve it? It's an open question, and I'm, of course, uh, more than happy to discuss it with you. Okay, thanks. I'll hand over the So from a security research perspective, and I'm sure Christopher will agree with me, uh, of course, we need to move the level of the security up, not only from the vendors, but also from the, the complete chain. And at the same time, we need to involve uh, the, 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 all the parties, when we, and I'm specifically speaking about uh, critical infrastructure and decision makers, not only to regulate um, exploit market or zero-day market, but also to regulate the purchase or, or the acquisition of items, not only in terms of cost, but also in terms of uh, security, if the device has an impact or can have an impact on the, everybody's life, physical or cyber. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Christopher? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I think we also, the researchers are part of the equation, meaning that we also need to improve how we look at the complexity, which is still outside. I mean, if we just look at there is a vulnerability, then there is an exploit, then there is a zero day, and that's it. I think we are completely missing the complexity, either of the, both of a device, of a target, but also of an industry. So if we really want to improve a number of things, probably we need to understand the complexity of what is outside. And for manufacturers, for the industry, I would say that um, there are simple things that can be done, but nowadays are not done. For example, uh, let's assume that you are buying, you are building a device, you are buying, I don't know, uh, hundreds of thousands of chips or software components, licenses of software components. You are buying a product, right? So, and then you are tasked with building a secure product. This means that you should also apply the same due diligence to what you buy. So why don't you ask to your suppliers, what, what kind of security process do you have for this solution, for this chip, for this component? Do you actually do perform source code review? Do you have a process for that? Do you have a secure DLC in place, for example? Do you have uh, periodical testing of your component before actually buy. These are cheap questions. These, they come for free because you're actually buying it. So as a buyer, you, it's your right to know the security quality of what you're buying. Because it, otherwise it would be impossible for you to have to build a secure product and a secure device if you're not applying the same consideration and threat model to what you're buying from. One of the lack, problem that we have is that we have either a lack of threat models across the chains because you just buy components instead of buying risks, because that's what you're actually buying, mm -hmm. risks, along with your products. And we don't, either we don't have that or we have them inconsistently. A very quick example. There are um, situations where you would like to have a hardware-resistant device, okay? And then against fault injection attacks and all these things, and say, yes, we have trust for that. Trust them by design does not protect against physical level attacks. So you have to know that if you want to build something which is fault injection resistant, you need to add that in yourself. So this kind of threat modeling at the different level have a serious impact. So this means that at either place of the chain, you need to be aware what you're buying, for what purpose, for what threat model, and what kind pro of product are giving you to the next stage, which may be the infield. Yeah. Because if the threat model does not include, I don't know, user level security, there is no point in testing that, well, it leaks private data or personal, informa or private, uh, personal information, because it was not designed for that. Mm. Still, you can claim that you want it, <coughs> but it should be factored in from the start. Yep. Yeah, trust. Don't trust good people, trust good processes, right? Yes, yeah, okay. definitely. And uh, last but not least, I'll hand over to uh, Nicholas. I think what has just been said uh, really resonates with me personally. I think, of course, security start, start with ourselves. We have to, uh, to follow our best practices, but also um, encourage dialogue with uh, all our providers as well. Um, instead of expecting, instead of uh, assuming that they, they will be secure, at least engaging them in a dialogue Ask them what are their security practices. Ask them to provide uh, artifacts of um, 
of their, their security, whether it is uh, source code uh, scanning reports, whether it is uh, in the independent uh, security assessment or uh, other form of activities, may, uh, may help us having a, a better sense of uh, what we are dealing with. Okay. Uh, with that, I'd like uh, everyone to join me in thanking the panelists. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for the